Hey everyone, Jacob here from Painted for Combat, and if you're in this hobby, you're likely aware from the flood of content we've been hit with, Skaven Tide has just come out. A box set of 70 or so miniatures that has just been released for Age of Sigmar's new edition of their game. And in that box is a plethora of Ratfolk miniatures. Some are updates to existing models, and some are beautifully sculpted new miniatures. People are really excited about these new sculpts, and it's given rise to some awesome videos and content from some creators across social media. From guides, tutorials, to challenge videos. There's some awesome stuff out there now, and frankly, it's got me wanting to paint some rats. Now, I don't have the Skaventide box. I don't have the funds, nor do I have the need, to be buying specifically Age of Sigmar miniatures. So instead, I'm going to be taking a shot at a model I already have. A giant rat with a goblin rider, from the recent Dungeons & Lasers 5 Kickstarter. Up until this point, you have seen me painting minis for combat, as the channel name would suggest. Minis that have been painted fast enough to get them on the table. This mini, however, I'm going to take some time on, spending a few more hours on this model to push it beyond my usual tabletop standard. For this model, I won't be quite painting in sub-assemblies, but I am going to keep the base separate. This model is sculpted in a way that a lot of the innermost details are going to be hard to paint, but by keeping the base separate, I should at least be able to get into the visible areas of detail under here. With this rat mount, I want to try a few new various techniques that I've seen crop up in the wake of the Skaven Tide release. Specifically, I want to have a go at using some high saturated shadow tones, as this is something I really liked the application of in Ninjon's videos of painting his Skaven. Ultimately, I want this rat to have a light grey fur, but by using this technique we're going to be able to build up some interest in those shadow tones, rather than just working from black to grey to white. So for this shadow tone, undercoat, whatever you want to call it, we're going to be going with a rich red, which isn't something you'd usually see when you're trying to build up to a grey. And this will be going down everywhere that'll either be fur or skin later on, because we'll be using some similar colours across both of those areas. And not much of the shadow tone will actually be visible in the final paint job, just enough to give a bit of interest and depth to those recesses, where usually you might just use a black or a dark grey. With that done, we come back in, and for now I'm going to leave the fleshy skin areas as they're going to be a different colour, but I'm going to come in and cover almost 90% of our fur with my mid-tone, a kind of desaturated brown-grey. If I was strictly following the video I was referencing here, I should have mixed in a little bit of red to this mid-tone first for an extra step in the transition, but I want this done in more or less three layers. So rather than futzing around with a bunch of transitional layers between the shades, I'm just going to jump straight up to our full strength midtone. As I come in and add in my grey brown midtone, I'm making sure to leave the deepest recesses our nice vibrant red base coat, as well as a few choice areas where the sculpted detail has a little more depth. Now, usually on a model like this, what I would do is I would complete the whole mini in stages, base coat the whole thing, do our midtones on the whole thing, highlight the whole thing, and then do any extras at the end. But with this rat, I want to take it piece by piece. I already know this is going to be a longer paint job, and hitting little milestones along the way will help a lot keeping motivation throughout the paint job. So naturally, with this in mind, we'll be finishing off the fur first. Coming in not quite with a highlight, but just simply the brightest part of our fur, which is finally going to be our light grey. Giving the fur its colour, and making this look like a truly grimy sewer rat. Balancing time on longer projects like this can be tricky. I find that setting little milestones helps keep me motivated and makes sure that each part of the model gets the attention it deserves. Which is why I prefer to take models like this in chunks, rather than rushing one area of the model because I'm excited to move on to the next step somewhere else. Admittedly, I do stray from this piece-by-piece -piece approach a couple of times throughout the model. Here, for example. Rather than finishing the flesh and skin areas that we'd started, I put down the brown base coat on all of the brown areas of the model. And here, I'm base coating all of the details that will eventually be brown. So we're talking cloth, leather, wood, anything that will work up from a brown, even if the midtones and highlights will be different across these areas.
And with the brown base coat done, we can move back to the skin and the tail. I'm going to be kind of working in tandem across these two areas as each of them dry. The tail gets a vibrant pink base coat, something punchy that'll stand out next to all of the browns and greys across this model. And it will help provide some balance for the other saturated colours that will eventually be on our goblin rider. This gets highlighted with a couple of shades of lighter pink and eventually a pink mixed with off-white on all of the top facing areas. For the skin, I'll be using the same mid-tone that I used on the fur, to help blend these organic parts of the model together. But rather than moving up to a light grey like we did with our fur, we're going to be adding in some skin tone to this brown and doing a few passes, adding in more of the skin tone as we move through the layers. until eventually we're doing a highlight of our pure skin tone. After that, I do a bit of a magenta glaze over some of the areas of skin, just to give the model a little bit more life. For example, this is going on the muzzle and the joints of the fleshy areas on the model. And now we can shift our focus back to the various brown details. Looking at our brown base coat, now that it's next to our finished fur and skin, I think I want it to be a little bit darker, just to increase the contrast between the areas we've done and the browns. So before moving on to the highlights of the leathers or the wood, I go in and put in a dark brown wash over this, just to darken that colour a little bit. For the wooden details, I'll be going for a more desaturated brown, working up to an almost off-white highlight. And as I'm doing this, I'm making sure to accentuate the wood grain that's sculpted into the model, and anywhere that it isn't sculpted in that I'm adding this detail, I'm making sure to paint that texture in as we go. And after working through our midtones and highlights, I glaze in a little bit of green in some of the corners of this wood, making it look old and rotted. As opposed to our more desaturated wood, the leathers will be getting a series of warmer brown highlights. I start this with a warm brown midtone, and add in more and more off-white to the mix as we move through the layers of highlights. Working up the layers and brightness as we go over the details in smaller and smaller areas, eventually just picking out the tiniest points with our final highlight. But in some of the leather areas, I'll instead opt to hatch in these highlights, doing dozens of low coverage lines, rather than a single solid stroke. As we move through our highlights, this will start building up a visual texture, as if this leather has been worn down by dozens of scratches or cuts. This helps give a more natural finish to some of these areas of the model that wouldn't be perfectly smooth. 
This both adds a bit of believability to the leathers, but also breaks up the browns a wee bit without having to swap out the colours I'm actually using. For example, the shoulder pad and the harness, they look like different materials even though they're painted with the same colours. They're the same colours, the same tones, and even the same brightness, but this change in texture helps them stand out as ever so slightly different materials. And with just these four areas done, the fur, the skin, the tail, and the browns, a lot of the big areas of our model are finished, meaning it will just be a matter of following very similar steps across the rest of the mini with various different colours, using a mix of the techniques of layering, glazing, and hatching that we've used so far. A quick layering of brown and a highlight of off-white on the ropes is enough to give these some definition and separation without making them overpower the contrast of the leather. And while I'm here I'll use the same off-white to highlight the claws and the teeth. A few drops of speed paint can go over some of the canvas and paper details on the backpack. These aren't the most important things, so I'm happy to use speed paint to just get some colour on them. There's a few metallic areas across this model, from the headpiece to the lantern to the belt buckles and the shackles, and I think I'm even going to use a metallic base coat on the fish scales to replicate the reflectiveness that they would have. For the metal headpiece on this rat, I glaze in some differing browns and oranges to give a slight worn and rusted look to the crevices. For the fish, I'm going to glaze in some blues and some greens to give it that almost iridescent sheen that fish scales have, and then I'll come in and give it an all over black wash. This little lantern looks like a fun place to add some interest, and I think I might go for a little OSL effect here, just something subtle. Using some layers of orange and white, I create the light of the lantern itself, and then using a bright orange mixed with a small amount of yellow, watered down to a glaze, I start glazing in the light on the fur and the objects around the lantern. With this thin layer of glaze on the model, I try and feather out the edges, and here I'm pushing my brush towards the brightest point as I do, to make sure that any pooling of this bright orange occurs where the light would be the brightest. And finally, anywhere on the fur that I think this effect has gotten a little too intense, I come back in with an almost pure white highlight. Using this light grey almost white, I further hatch some highlights. This keeps the area brighter, but makes it appear as if individual strands of fur are reflecting the light, rather than just being tinted yellow by it. And now, finally, we can move on to our Goblin Rider and he'll be getting a pretty similar treatment as the rest of the model, but his specific colour scheme is going to be in line with a bunch of goblin infantry that I painted recently. And you can see that video over here. That means he's going to get a vibrant red cloak and a highly saturated green skin tone. I base coated this cloak with the darker red that comes in the Army Painter Fanatic Mega Set. I love this set, but I ran into an issue here that I often have with this paint. The reds in this set are all cool reds. Which means if they're placed alongside warmer colours like we see on this model, they look pink. Now personally I would have preferred that this mega set came with warmer reds that look red no matter what colour they're placed next to. If we want to talk Warhammer for a second here, let's say you have a Blood Angels player who's painting their army. If they use this army painter red and then place their army next to someone that let's say used Mephiston red from Games Workshop, their models are going to straight up look pink. Anyway, I combat this by using a quick, thin coat of speed paint blood red over these areas, which makes a huge difference, making the reds look red. This also adds in a quick layer of shadow, which I'm not going to complain about. From here, I can come in with a few layers of highlights in a simple layering fashion to add some detail to the cloak. I follow a similar process on his yellow trousers, his black boots, and his brown undercoat, though the brown will also get a little bit of hatched highlighting as well. The goblin's skin will be getting a similar treatment to his other details, but rather than just doing one or two layers of highlights, I'll take it in a few more in-between stages to get a cleaner blend. Starting with a dark green base coat, I then mix in a little bit of mid-tone and keep moving up in brightness until I'm layering purely that mid-tone, and then mixing in a little bit of highlight. All in all, the skin was likely six or seven layers of varying mixes of these three paints, helping to give a smooth transition from shadow to highlight.
The base was a quick paint job, consisting of dry brushing and speed paints, with a gloss varnish over the swamp water. And I made sure to keep this base a little bit darker, to help emphasise the lighter tone and more saturated colours of the model sitting on it. So compared to my faster paint jobs, ranging anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, I've put in almost 5 or 6 hours on this model, and I could not be happier with the results for the time that I spent. Every so often it is nice to actually take your time and make the most of a model, rather than just getting paint on it to put on the table. So what do you reckon? This was my first time using a few of these techniques, and for things like the hatching it was only my second or third try. Overall I'm really happy with the outcome, and honestly I think this guy's going to sit on my desk as a display piece for a good wee while. So let me know, has the release of Skaventide made you interested to paint some vermin-like creatures for your table, or are you finding interest in these tutorials that are coming with the release of Skaventide, some new and interesting techniques that we're seeing from creators? Regardless, if you've made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy, please hit like down below to let YouTube know, and subscribe to see more of my hobbying in the future, from 3D printing to model painting. Thanks for watching, and as always, have a good one.